Hello and a very warm welcome to episode 22 of the Green Bean podcast. My name is Katie and this is Jack and we're both really really glad that you're here whether it's your first time joining us or you've been here many times before. We're recording this in my studio in Devon in the southwest of England and it's a podcast where I chat about my creative practice which includes drawing and knitting and sewing and as of this episode I'll be including some mending and some spinning for the first time as well. Um, Jack is not particularly happy about being on my lap right now because I'm wearing dungarees and he does not like denim. He prefers softer fabrics to sit on as his throne so he's quite keen to go away but I'm quite keen to get started. Um, this is a special episode for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first and probably most obvious reason is that I'm recording this in March of 2020 when we are in the middle of the worldwide outbreak of the COVID-19 virus and it's impacting almost everybody in, in different capacities, in different ways, depending on where you are. Um, and it's having a huge impact on all of our lives. So to some extent, what I'm working on and what's included in this episode is obviously impacted by that. And I just wanted to let all of you watching know that I'm thinking of you and hoping that you're, you're safe and your family and friends are safe and you're coping with whatever level of isolation or social distancing that you're, you're living with in order to try and keep yourself and those around you safe as well. Um, for us, because of where we live, we are quite isolated anyway, so it's not a huge change of lifestyle for us. We're very fortunate. Um, we live close to Dartmoor and within the current guidelines we're still allowed to get out there for a walk every day. Obviously that might change um, even as you're watching this from the time that I'm recording it, but at the moment obviously we're keeping with the guidelines and doing what we can to keep ourselves and our community safe. The second thing that's special about this episode is that I am going to take you on a little adventure with me to Dorset. I recently launched a new range of rubber stamps in my online shop. Um, I had planned to release them at Wonderwall Wales at the end of April, but that, along with almost all the other events I had planned for the year, has quite rightly been cancelled in order to keep everybody safe and and you know do what we need to do in the wake of the pandemic that's happening all around us. So I decided to release those stamps online but um, before I got the stamps in my possession I actually went to the English stamp company in Dorset who are the manufacturers that I work with. Um, now for those who aren't aware of British geography Dorset is just one county east from Devon along the coast but it's a long drive and that's because we don't really have any motorways in either of our counties. We're both quite rural. Um, so it actually took me three and a half hours to get there because we we're on the west side of Devon and Dorset um, and the English Stamp Company is on the east side of Dorset. So it was, it was a long drive for, for a day trip, but so, so stunning and beautiful. So I've included some of the footage of my drive through the stunning village of Corfe Castle, you'll spot the ruins of the castle on my drive and then I included some footage of the dogs. The English Stamp Company are firmly dog people so I knew that I would get on with them really well. I met the office dogs and then we went into the factory and actually got to see some of my stamps being made. So I hope that you'll enjoy that part of the episode as well as all of my regular segments but most of all Thanks for being here and I hope that you find a little comfort in hanging out for a while and chatting about crafts and creativity.
I'm in my studio today working on some new rubber stamp designs and I'm really excited about them. I've been working on them quietly for a few weeks. Um, I've shared a bit of the process on Patreon and actually some of my patrons contributed suggestions and ideas for what might be included in the new range. So that's been really fun to be including some requests from uh, patrons as well as my own ideas for what I was going to bring in this time. And the reason I'm doing it now is because I'm about to pay a visit to the factory. Um, my stamps are manufactured by the English Stamp Company, who are based in Dorset. That's one county east of Devon, where I live. That sounds like they're really close, but uh, they're on the east side of Dorset and I'm on the west side of Devon. So it's actually a three hour drive for me to get there. But I've been promised a nice cup of tea and some dogs to meet when I get there. So it's going to be great and I'm really looking forward to seeing the process of how my stamps are made. I, well, from what I understand, part of the process is secret so I won't be allowed to see the whole factory but I'll definitely be able to see and share with you some of the process of the stamps coming together. So in order to see my stamps being made I need to make the new designs and here's what I've been working on. So at the top of the page I've got some new handmade designs. I really wanted to introduce something to the collection that was a little bit less floral because I know flowers are not for everybody. So I've included these more graphic versions. I've also, I'm expanding the previous range of handmade which included a bowl of yarn and a spool of thread for knitters, crocheters and sewers. And I've had several requests to include one that said hand spun. So what I've actually done is a spindle and a spinning wheel to add to that collection. And the rest of the stamps that I'm doing are um, mini one inch animals. I've been really excited to bring these in. I've had a lot of people say that they like to use my stamps in their journals or on calendars and sometimes the, the larger stamps are a little bit big. So I'm excited to be adding some uh, smaller designs to the range so that the stamps have a bit more flexibility. Now the top animal that my patrons requested was a hedgehog. So there's definitely going to be a hedgehog. Um, I also get a lot of requests for cats. So there's going to be some cats in there as well and a few surprises. So you can see that for these animals I've done a rough pencil sketch already so I used I actually used a button to sketch out a circle of about the right size that I wanted to draw in and then I've sketched my animals. I'm not sure if you'll be able to identify the sketches so we've got a, a hedgehog, a squirrel, two cats playing with yarn, a rabbit, a sheep, an owl, two dinosaurs, those are for me, an oyster catcher like the oyster catcher from the previous green bean and a pony. I reckon it's a Dartmoor pony, I don't see why it shouldn't be. Um, so I've done these pencil sketches and I'm working on my usual um, just recycled photocopy paper and I've got another blank sheet underneath. That's just so that I'm not working on such a hard surface. I find it more pleasant and easier to draw when the surface underneath is not just straight onto the table. So just, just one or two sheets of paper underneath seems to be enough to make that difference. And I'm drawing in my ever faithful favourite Pigma Micron pens. So the one I'm using at the moment is the 01, which is a quarter of a millimetre line thickness.
I have been rather let off the hook with this particular knitting project. Um, as some of you will know that I was due to be making a trip to America actually this coming weekend as I record. Um, it's Thursday and I would have been leaving on Sunday morning. Um, for obvious reasons that trip has been cancelled and one of the reasons uh, for my trip obviously I was going to have some events um, on the other side of the Atlantic I was gonna have a pop-up shop at Brooklyn General Store and at the Woolly Thistle in New Hampshire both of which have been sadly postponed we are hoping to rearrange them for later in the year so fingers crossed that uh, once the crisis has passed, we'll be able to make plans to make those events happen again. But the initial reason that I planned a trip to America was to celebrate my dear friend Molly's special birthday. Um, Molly and I met on, on Flickr, I believe it was, if you remember the days of Flickr many years ago. Um, we were both bloggers at the time, Molly is still a blogger. And um, she also is one of the hosts of the Very Serious Crafts audio podcast, which I really recommend if you haven't checked it out. They are uh, three very enthusiastic and very funny crafters. Um, it's, a, it's a really enjoyable show. But Molly and I have been friends for a long time. We first met in person in 2010. So this year marks 10 years that we've been friends in real life, if you like. Um, and we quite often, whenever I get the chance to go to America, I try and get to meet up with Molly. So this project that I'm working on is a jumper for her 40th birthday. Um, and all of you knitters out there will know that making a jumper as a gift is, is a major act of devotion. And it, it tells you how important Molly, to me, Molly is to me as a friend, that I'm willing to make this happen for her. Now it's worth saying that uh, she does know that this is happening, so although I don't think she watches the podcast, the jumper is not a surprise. I asked her for her measurements, and in fact she kind of asked me for the jumper. She, When she was visiting here last, which I believe was in 2018, I was working on my own version of this jumper, and she expressed a like for it, and never since then I've been thinking that I would make her a version so here we are. It is the Raspberry Twirl Jumper by Francesca Hughes. Now, I was actually a test knitter for this jumper. That's when I knitted my first version, which is in shades of blues and greens. And I used the recommended yarn for that, which were all um, Viola yarns. And for Molly's version, I'm doing something slightly different. I'm using three different yarns from two different companies. And in order to make the gauge work, I'm actually working at a different gauge than recommended in the pattern. So I've had to rework the maths um, and figure it out a bit. So I'm not exactly following the pattern to the letter, although I'm following the pattern for the design and the shape of the jumper. I've done my own maths to figure out and make sure that it's going to be the right fit for Molly. Molly is very lucky that she is not quite the same size as me because I'm really liking how this jumper is looking and definitely thinking that I'd like to make a, a pink version like this for myself. So the three yarns that I'm using are, starting with the thickest, this gorgeous peachy pink from John Arban, which is from their new Yarnadelic range, which came out earlier this year. It's a sport weight, 100% um, Corriedale, um, in this lovely peachy colour, which is called Pink Moon. And the second yarn is from John Arban again, from their Harvest Hues range, which is a Merino and Swabbles. Um, and it's a dark pink called Rose Bay. And the third yarn is a silk mohair from Viola. So this is actually one of the recommended yarns. Um, I believe this is a one of a kind colorway from her. It's a kind of uh, pale silvery brown color. And I swatched the, with these three colors together to make sure that I was happy with how the stripe sequence worked. 
um, the way that Frankie's designed this pattern is the the front side of the garment is this lovely textured textured stripe where the colours all blend into one another and it's it's just beautiful it's a really simple elegant jumper because of the light gauge that you knit it at it feels kind of airy and lovely to wear I really really like my version of it so I think that Molly's going to be pleased with hers as well however it is now three days before I would have been making my trip and this is all of Molly's jumper that exists. Uh, this is the first piece, the front. Um, obviously I would have had the back and the two sleeves to do. There was no way Molly was going to get a jumper next week. Um, even though I have since I had to make the decision to cancel my trip, I actually decided to cancel the trip before um, UK citizens were banned from travelling to America and before the airports were closed I had decided anyway that it was uh, the best decision not to travel but um, so once I made that decision I did sort of slow down with my knitting but even if I had been able to carry on knitting at full speed there's no way I was going to be finishing this on time because I don't know about you but I always forget when I'm doing a garment with seams and picking up stitches that all of those finishing details take a lot of time as well. Um, so I'm really enjoying the fact that I can just carry on with this at a more leisurely pace. It's, um, it's all over garter stitch so it's a really relaxing knit. There's not a lot of attention that needs to be paid apart from making sure that I keep the stripe sequence correct and managing the three balls of yarn which can be a bit of a fiddle I'll admit it but um, it's gone back to being a relaxing and soothing project that I can work on while I'm having online chats with people. I don't know about you, but I'm taking part in a lot of Zoom and Skype chats with my friends at the moment, trying to keep in touch with people that we, we can't see in person for the time being, and online knit groups and that kind of thing. So it's the perfect project for that, to um, be able to hold a conversation and keep knitting at the same time.
In terms of sewing, I've been really feeling drawn to comforting familiar projects lately. And I think part of that is being, you know, tied up and stressed and anxious about what's going on in the world around us and needing to come to my crafting for a bit of comfort and a bit of reassurance. And for me, that means going back to making familiar sewing projects rather than necessarily working on something new. So I know in the last episode I shared a pair of trousers that I'd started making. I actually haven't made any progress on those since last time because I got scared and it just hasn't felt like the time to push myself into doing a project that feels a bit new and a bit scary and instead I've gone back to taking comfort in doing some more familiar projects. What I've actually done is gone on a spree of cutting out uh, fabric for several different versions of familiar projects but the first one that I'm going to be sewing is a new version of this blouse that I'm wearing which is the Hedwig blouse from Republic du Chiffon. And I had a piece of fabric in my stash that I'd bought as a remnant. So it was the very last piece that I got my hands on with this really, really cute bugs and beetles print on it. They only had one meter and a quarter. So I just, I loved the print so much. I bought it anyway, not knowing what I would be able to do with it, hoping I'd be able to get a blouse of some kind. Um, so I cut the pattern pieces out, um, the paper pattern pieces out and laid them out on the fabric and it was very clear that I was not going to have enough fabric to do a long sleeve blouse. So what I've decided to do is shorten the sleeves, so I'm going for a short sleeve version. Um, but even so I still didn't have enough fabric to do, to cut the collar as was recommended in the pattern, so I had to do a little bit of jiggery pokery to try and fit the pattern pieces on and I consulted my dear friend Angela, hi Angela if you're watching, who's a bit more of an experienced seamstress than me, about uh, cutting the collar pieces in two halves. So normally a collar is a single piece of fabric um, but all I had left was a very narrow piece of this bug fabric so what I've done is I've added a seam halfway around the collar at the back so I'm hoping that it won't be too noticeable. Um, it might add a little bit of bulk behind the neck but um, what it meant is that I could cut the required collar pieces because much as I like my contrasting collar on this dinosaur shirt for my my beetle shirt I wanted the collar to be in the same patterned fabric. So that's all cut out and ready to go and I'm ready to make a start on it. And I'm also going to be making another version of my pinafore dress in green. I don't know why I didn't make my first pinafore dress in green. I felt um, I felt drawn for some reason to have a red corduroy dress in my wardrobe, but the obvious second choice was green. So I've cut out a green corduroy dress that I'm going to be making as well. And I'm really looking forward to having those two pieces in my spring wardrobe.
there are a couple of reasons why I've decided to start including a mending segment in the podcast. The first of which is that I am rubbish at mending and I am one of those crafters who is just always more drawn to the shiny new project than the repairs pile. So I'm hoping that including a mending segment in the podcast is going to encourage me to pick up those projects that just need a little bit of work on and um, and bring them back into rotation rather than leave them sitting and feeling sorry for themselves in a pile. But the other reason is that it gives me a reason to revisit projects, particularly projects that you might not have seen because I made them before I started podcasting but also to revisit projects that you have seen me make on the podcast and be able to talk about how they're wearing, what kind of problems or benefits I might have encountered with them. And um, yeah, just talk about the ongoing maintenance of my handmade wardrobe, because it's not like I make a thing and then I wear it once and that's it and it looks pristine forever. I I ask a lot of my handmade clothes. I'm, I'm living in them and wearing them all the time. and some of them are starting to show signs of that wear and tear. So the garment that I've picked to show you today is my dinosaur jumpsuit that I made last summer. Um, with this really cute dinosaur fabric from Stoff and Still. And what's going on here is that we've got a few split seams around the bottom. Uh, this has happened when I've sat down. Um, and because I do have a tendency to like to curl my legs up, to cross my legs, that kind of thing. Um, and it's not the most sturdy fabric. So I've got a few holes down here that I need to attend to. But it's also made me think that actually I need to reinforce those seams a bit because all I did was sew the seam and then finish the edge with my pinking shears. And what I actually think is that the seams need a little bit more stability than that. Um, so what I'm going to do is cover them in bias binding. Anything but get out and learn how to use my overlocker. I'm still avoiding that. So I'm going to cut some bias binding and cover these seams, um, which will give them just a little extra layer of security, I hope. Now I'm aware that this is a very soft and flimsy fabric, so eventually the um, the bottom is probably going to wear out of these um, these trousers and that's going to be a very sad day but until then I'm going to really enjoy wearing them but what it does mean is that when I make a second incarnation of this jumpsuit that I will bear that in mind so I do have fabric in my stash with um, leaves and beetles on it that I was planning to make another version of this jumpsuit with for this summer and because of what I've learned through this version, what I will do is incorporate that bias binding or some kind of extra seam finishing when I first make the project and hope that initially it might last a little bit longer before I need to repair it. So the first thing I'm doing here is carefully hand sewing those broken seams back into place, particularly the one that's completely ripped. Um, now I could do this all on the machine, but there's something about doing it by hand that's a little bit more precise. Um, obviously the hand stitching won't be enough on its own to hold this poor uh, crotch seam together. It's going to need a little bit more enforcement than that. But just starting with a bit of hand stitching means that I, I can be quite precise about getting things back in the right place where they should be. And there's something really satisfying about mending once you get going with it. I don't know why I avoid it so much. My, um, my grandma, who is the person who taught me both how to sew and how to knit, um, was a great make-doer and mender in her time. Um, if ever anything was broken or in need of repair, we would always take it to her and she would be the one who would come up with 
ingenious solutions for things, not just sewing and knitting, but like um, household repairs. She was a genius at, um, at fixing things up. So I don't know why I haven't inherited so much of that tendency. I think maybe it's a generational thing that she um, grew up and lived through the Second World War and there was much more of an, an attitude of mending that was, was part of her psyche than there is with us who grew up in the uh, late part of the 20th century. But definitely it's, it's a useful skill to have and, and an enjoyable process as well. I think I, hopefully through including it in the podcast and doing mending more often, I will start to appreciate it again as something enjoyable and satisfying rather than Oh, that annoying pile of tasks in the corner that I need to attend to.
Something really unprecedented has happened since I last recorded, and that is that I have taken to a regular practice of spinning. Um, so you might know that I had my very first spinning lesson last year with my friend Bex, who hosts the Tiny Fibre Studio podcast. She is an amazing and accomplished spinner, and yeah, I couldn't have asked for a better first time teacher. But after that first lesson, it didn't really click. And I don't know why it didn't click. I certainly was interested and I enjoyed the lesson, but it just needed a little bit longer to seep into my brain, I think. Um, and I think the turning point was when I listened to the Tog and Thel podcast, which is an audio podcast. Um, the host is a wonderful woman named Ducky. And if you haven't listened to the podcast and you love wool and the craft of working with wool in any way, I really recommend giving it a listen. And she has the most evocative description of learning to spin. And she speaks about it in terms of being a muscle memory, a skill that our hands have known for time, so much time. and. I really appreciated her description of learning to spin, not as like trying to do it right, but just as a really sensual and emotional process of learning to do something that um, human hands, particularly women's hands, have done for thousands upon thousands of years. And it was that really romantic description of spinning that made me think, yeah, I really, really want to learn how to do this. And then, it was talking to my friend Mars, who hosts the Hey Brownberry podcast and is also a amazing teacher of spinning. She teaches a lot of people to uh, begin spinning with a drop spindle. She suggested that I just practice for 15 minutes a day. And that seems to have been the breakthrough for me since I've started just doing 15 minutes. Rarely I'll do a little bit more, but my commitment is to 15 minutes a day. And just that amount of practice is really familiarising my hands with the process and getting a feel for what I'm doing. And I actually now, I feel quite strange if I haven't done my 15 minutes of spinning a day. And I'm sure anybody who is a long time spinner will, will relate to that feeling. And I'm definitely finding it a really therapeutic and soothing process. And at the moment, I'm not particularly attached to any kind of result. I'm just practicing consistency, getting a feel for the fibre, learning to work with my spindle. Um, those of you who do know about spinning will have noticed that my drafting and my spinning are two very separate processes at the moment. I haven't quite got my hands around doing both of those activities at the same time. And I think maybe I never will with a with a drop spindle. Maybe that's something that comes with using a wheel. I don't know, but I'm just really enjoying getting to know the process, getting a feel for what I'm doing and feeling really inspired to, to learn more and get more comfortable with this amazing craft. I'm really enjoying it. So the fibre that I'm spinning was actually a gift from one of the lovely members of my knitting group, um, who, by the way, I hold largely responsible for my uh, my taking up spinning. Um, obviously, Bex is one of those people, but um, almost all the other members of my group are spinners as well. So they've been like subtly encouraging me, or not so subtly, um, for the whole time that I've been going along to that group to learn to spin. And one of them had this beautiful murky green fibre that they'd received as part of a club, and it wasn't their cup of tea at all. And they said as soon as they saw it, they knew that it would be just right for me. And obviously she was right. Um, I love a good murky green. Um, so the fibre is a blend of 50-50 Merino and Shetland. And although the overall tone is green, it's got little bits of kind of pinky red in it. So it's got some interest and I'm really enjoying working with it. Obviously, 
it's my first spin, so I don't have much to compare it to in terms of how it's spinning, but I'm, I think I'm finding it nice and easy to draft and to get a relatively consistent spin with. But I'm looking forward to getting to work with some different fibres and having some something to compare it to and, and learn the difference and really feel that difference, that subtlety in my fingers. So I'm pretty excited about getting into this process and um, and sharing it with you as well. I can't wait to see my first yarn come together. So actually at the moment this is my third turtle that I'm working on. Um, there's quite a lot of inconsistency in between the first one and the second one and I'm trying not to fuss too much. Um, I'm sure anybody who's learned to spin will be able to relate that things are not going to be even and perfect the first time around. So I've got my first two turtles here. Um, this was the first one which is kind of a bit thick and thin and inconsistent and the second one I was trying to see if how fine I could keep it um, and some of it is very very fine which probably means it's a bit um, tightly spun because I was trying to stop it from breaking so probably the ideal balance is somewhere between those two but I'm just enjoying the process of, of getting to know it and um, figuring out what I'm doing.
Finally, I wanted to round out this episode with another graphic novel recommendation for you. Um, I know that several people have been enjoying the fact that I've picked comic books as my recommendations in the last few podcasts and seen as they're one of my favourite things to read as well as my favourite thing to write, I thought I'd pick another one off my shelf and fortunately I've just finished reading an absolutely stonkingly good one which is called On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden and it's nice and big. You might know that I like a nice big comic book. My own um, memoir, Lighter Than My Shadow, was over 500 pages long so I very much empathise with Tilly with having the task of a, a very large book to work on. Although I believe that On a Sunbeam was originally published as a web comic and perhaps even is still available for you to read for free online. So if you don't have the means at the moment of either getting to a bookshop or having a book delivered, you can read the whole of this book online for free, which is amazing. Um, so the first thing to mention is that it is beautifully drawn. The artwork is so evocative and stunning. And the setting is kind of post-apocalyptic space odyssey I guess it's I don't want to spoil it by telling you too much um, but it's definitely set in space and the um, there's also like a boarding school aspect to it it's it's a lot about relationships and found family which I really appreciate so it deals with queer relationships and there's a non-binary character which is handled really sympathetically and nicely and all in all, it's just a beautiful story of friendship and family. And I really, really enjoyed it. I also loved the kind of the full immersion experience of being in this this world that Tilly's constructed and the ability to um, to visualize it and and make it feel real. And I'm waffling now because I just loved this book so much. But um, yeah, it's very like absorbing and I think because of the length of it being such a long comic you get to know the characters and the setting really well and that I find that really really emotional experience even more so than when you read a book that doesn't have pictures but when you're reading a graphic novel it's just it's really powerful and I really enjoyed it so that's my top book recommendation this time On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden I hope you enjoy it Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Green Bean Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed catching up with what we've been up to. If you want to catch us between now and the next episode, we have a Patreon. And at the moment, we are so incredibly grateful for everyone who's choosing and able to support us over there. It's, it's really making a huge difference, so thank you for that. And if you're able to support on Patreon, you get the benefit of having extra episodes in between every public episode that goes out on YouTube. And um, I try as well to do weekly vlogs and share other bits of the projects and things that I'm working on over there. If Patreon's not your thing, you can also find us on Instagram and Ravelry as Katie Greenbean. It is mostly photos of Jack, but I do post other things on there as well. Once again, thank you so much for spending a bit of time hanging out with us, and I hope that you're keeping well and finding some joy in your own creative projects. I will see you soon. Take care. Bye.